Do you care enough about your box office or guest service operation? If you're a leader in arts and culture and more than 70% of you registered for today's webinar are, then hear me say, I think you could care more, should care more. My name is Jill Robinson and I'm CEO of TRG Arts and during our hour together today, I'm gonna to tell you not only why I think so, but why this care could help your organization be more resilient and better thrive through the next decade. Welcome to all of you to another session in TRG's webinar series designed for the learning leader in arts and culture. Today's session entitled, You Don't Care Enough About Your Box Office and You Should, was inspired by content I developed for an international ticketing conference earlier this year in England. I was keynote, but that content had been simmering in my head for a while. I'd been in conversation with chief executives in a variety of global settings, and it stuck with me, this, this idea. Why? Well, headwinds are coming to the arts and cultural sector that are threatening. Exhibit A is the recession, impending and likely, which depending on your source, is going to be hitting us in the next year to 18 months. And Exhibit B is demographic or are demographic shifts. And these shifts are changing everything from financial infrastructure to programming choices, even mission statements. We're gonna talk much more about these ideas soon, but with those headwinds in mind, I'm increasingly interested in the concept of resiliency. And I've been focusing time in conversation with leaders who are driving toward this resiliency rather than sustainability. The difference, to me, sustainability is about the short term. Managing the day-to-day, -day, ensuring that business model works, balancing budgets, making payroll. This is all important stuff, no doubt. But resilience? Resilience is about the long game. Developing organizational culture that thrives through challenges and, and headwinds. These organizations have teams that are skilled and experienced and poised to take advantage of opportunity that may come and also poised to develop new models that may be required. Resiliency yields stick and staying power. And boy, our world needs arts and culture to stick and deliver the impact that only it can deliver now more than ever. And, but here's the reality. Clever tech, changes in consumer buying patterns, and frankly, sometimes complacent leadership has lulled us into ignoring the power of people, especially in our box offices, to create, and maintain, and sustain the relationships that drive resiliency. I've looked at the registration list for today. I see that most of you know us. We're the 25-year-old international management consulting firm. We work exclusively in the arts and cultural sector at TRG Arts, focused on growing patron loyalty, associated revenues. Our aim actually is to grow the resiliency of the sector and your box offices and guest service operations play a key role in this. Today, my goal is to inspire you to invest more of your leadership time and attention to this part of your organization and its operation because Time spent here can yield really big things. To start today, I'm going to share with you stories from the field, so to speak. I'll paint a picture of what we're seeing in our consulting across the continents on which we work. North America, Australia, the UK, and Europe, all as it relates to box office operations. And then we'll hear from you about what you believe the role of your box office to be. I'll combine your point of view with what we see in the data and case examples about the power of personal connection of humans to create resilient relationships for resilient organizations. And I'll share what the data is telling us about the headwinds that we're facing. 
Finally, we'll talk about the realities in your box office and guest services operations right now and what you might do or specific steps you might take tomorrow, next week, next month to move them in a different, more resilient direction. While we're together today, if you're motivated or inspired by something, please share it on Twitter at the TRG webinar hashtag so that others who weren't part who aren't part of this conversation and discussion today can learn. Okay, before we jump in a few housekeeping items. First, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions, not um, the chat function. Uh, you can do this by locating the Q&A feature on your main navigation bar on your screen. I will take as many questions as I can at the end. And know also that today's webinar will be recorded and in coming days, we'll share it with you by way of a follow-up email. Finally, if we don't get to your question or you've got something you'd like us to follow up with you on specifically, send us an email at let's talk at trgarts.com. Okay, Q&A feature, webinars recorded so you can share it. Let's talk at trgarts.com. Sustainability, resiliency. In, in data and tech-driven 2019 heading into 2020, I'm still always reminded that data doesn't do anything. People do everything. I'm not the only one who thinks so. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the global management consulting firm Accenture. They, receive, they release uh, annually a technology forecast in Primer about the tools and technology that they see are going to have an outsized impact on work and culture. And their 2019 release predicted the importance of this concept, human plus. The human plus worker or workforce, where employees incorporate technology to build on their unique and irreplaceable skills and experience. This is people empowered, made stronger through and with technology and data. It's with this concept in mind, actually, that I'm curious about how you'll answer the following two questions that are, that are going to help me see what you see related to box offices and guest service operations today. First, some instructions. Throughout today's webinar, I'll take moments um, there are a handful of them to ask all of you questions using Zoom's polling feature. My colleague Sam, who's in the room with me now, will queue up each polling question at the, at the appropriate time and a pop-up window is going to appear that looks like this. You'll have the opportunity to make one or many selections, as many as seems resonant with you. And once we have attendees, um, once I've given you enough time to respond, we'll share the results and it'll look like this. And I will react to those results in real time. So let's jump to our first question. Question one, and I am just going, yeah, there it is. Question one, what is the core function of the box office or guest service operation in your organization? You can start voting now. Is it selling tickets or admissions as the orders come in? Providing, number two, excellent customer service. Number three, meeting organizational revenue targets and goals. Number four, building customer patron relationships, customer or patron and patron, or finally, finding ways to leverage the apps, web, CRM systems, tech, technology to accomplish these things. Okay, I see you participating and I'm seeing that 60%, um, so I'm just gonna, gonna give it a few more seconds here. What's clear to me as you're responding is that you see your box office and guest service operations as key in building customer and patron relationships. 
providing excellent customer service and obviously transacting business is important but but your websites and apps and other things do that too i know that what's the lowest man on the totem pole here is meeting organizational revenue targets also finding ways to leverage technology to accomplish these things so i'm i suspect based on what i know about the field and how things are organized um, and sam has just given us a, a a winner here but how things are organized is that technology operates in a different department so your box office has a siloed role and your tech department has a siloed role it doesn't mean they don't work together it just means that your box office isn't responsible for leveraging technology. Okay, winner is building customer and patron relationships. Lowest score is revenue targets. Let's move on to the next question. Question number two. If you are the chief executive, so that would be like CEO, managing director, executive leader, uh, and if you like, you can remark on the behaviors of your chief exec. So I'd invite you, if you don't have that role, to just observe from your own catbird seat the behavior of him or her. So if, if you're the chief exec in the organization, to what degree do you think about your box office and its operations? Number one, I don't. I don't. It's not because I don't want to. I, I, my portfolio on a daily basis is full and I, I have to leave it to management. Number two, um, I think about it when there's something urgent or something's up, something's wrong. Number three, I see the potential I do. I, I just haven't yet made someone accountable for more. I haven't provided new resources really or tools for change. And number four, I'm invested. I, I put the box office at my table. I ensure there's clear authority and responsibility for income and customer relationship management and development. Okay, so I'm looking at you. And you are weighing in and you see like I do what the answer is. You see potential, it's why you're here. Let's just call that. Um, and some of you are being, um, some of you are being candid about what your um, answers really are. Looks like Sam, um, we didn't have an answer for them. I don't, is the, is, was number four populated like you see here? Okay, so in fact, that's the top answer in this poll. It went from zero to that really quickly. Is that what actually happened? Yeah, okay. So you're in this room because you see the potential and you are putting the box office in the center of, and you wanna hear more. And there are some of you who are saying, I don't, um, and I can't only when there's something, an emergency happening. There will be something here for all of you, but I'm encouraged and interested in how we can connect the dots during our time together between your intention and behavior and the revenue, sustainable, resilient revenues that you need um, in the next 10 years and more. Okay, so let's go back to this concept of human plus, this human connecting with humans, using technology to drive relationships to greater depth and connection. Listen, none of us is selling widgets or roofing. Uh, we provide experiences that entertain and they bring joy or depth of conversation. We lift and we teach and we make people laugh. And we bring value in completely different ways than other consumer goods. And our box office operations uh, help us these people help us make and deepen those connections every day, or they don't. If resiliency is our aim, I, I, I'm advocating that we're not fully leveraging one of our biggest tools in achieving it, the humans and Accenture's concept. Allow me to tell you why I think this, 
and, and what I see. I've brought a few stories today of what I'm seeing in the field. field. They're aggregated stories, um, archetypes, but I'm reasonably confident you're gonna recognize. This first story and narrative is the box office's tech support. Funnily, ironically, I suppose this narrative comes from a team that wants to innovate and wants to lead. They are, they are driving customers online while also having a box office. Tech is the way they know that. Our customers expect it, we need to deliver, except that these organizations operate in arts and culture, which often doesn't invest at the rate it needs to in technology. And as a result, the box office staff, well, they become tech support for links that don't work, purchase pathways that make no sense at all or forget key steps, transactions that take 27 clicks to get from point A to point B. Patrons get lost and confused on bad web infrastructure all the time. This case study data comes from a very large dance company in the United States. It's from a study that we did that included secret shopping and analysis of the box office operation from within, from customers, from the broader staff team. And one of the questions that we asked that you're reading already is what do you find to be the biggest complaint? This is an organization with an operating budget of more than 30 million US dollars. They have the resources, and yet, this is the complaint. This is one of the first times we saw this in, in such, such strength and consistent open narrative. It caught our attention. Uh, I hope it catches yours, and I'm curious if you know if this is one of the pain points in your box office. The second narrative I'll call the we believe what we read Loyalty is, is dead, Jill, <laughs> story. The organizations in this narrative know, like we all do, that millennials, the children of boomers, represent the largest demographic cohort in the Western world today, and what they say goes. They're broke, burdened by college debt, working hard, and will never, they're never gonna be a member or subscriber. These organizations read the news about the death of subscription and declining participation in the arts. They listen to their customers and friends, and they know the future is about volume, getting more people in the doors, including millennials as one-off ticket buyers. And so these organizations have smartly gotten ahead of this information and developed systems that accommodate volume, period. In fact, they're asking, why have a box office at all? People slow things down. What they've not done always is listen to their data to see how their patrons are actually behaving. More on that soon. Story and narrative number three is what I call, it's just fine as it is, narrative. We all know people like this who walk through life without asking too many questions of themselves who aren't open to challenge very well. The leaders in these organizations are laissez-faire with their box offices, allowing them to run without asking too many questions, letting them do their jobs, often with managers who've been in the business for a long time and have been there, done that. No one's paying attention in these narratives. No one's challenging them. And the result is that the box office operates like it's 1980, uh, 1985. Slow and systemic and totally responsive to the consumer and patron. Do we, do we think that's a good thing? Look at this similar case study, same analysis of a large theater organization in Canada. When asked uh, this staff was asked the question, when a patron is dissatisfied, uh, can I usually correct the problem to their satisfaction? Open narrative results from left to right. Patrons know that they can get a refund for any problem or dissatisfaction. We're supposed to do whatever a patron wants, including refunds after the patron sits through an entire performance. Usually, 
we're told to correct a problem by giving gift certificates and comp tickets. This can feel like it's the right thing to do. This can feel like uh, accommodating every patron need, including spending 20 minutes with a single consumer, uh, can be the right th thing. Uh, but, but it's counterintuitive, uh, but I'll tell you, it's not always a good thing for organizations that are looking to grow relationship and revenue from patrons. So do you recognize your organization in any of these narratives? You said in your earlier responses that the chief goal you had was to develop patron relationships through good customer service. I'm curious if you recognize uh, yourself. I'm also curious if, if you think you or your team's job is, is just about excellent customer service or using the back best tech, or if, if in fact you think it's running just fine, I, I would say think again. These attitudes I've described and more are killing the potential in box offices. And I, I want you to have a sense of urgency about this because headwinds are coming. I believe your organization deserves, must have, a box office operation and yes, a suite of tools that creates income and deepens customer relationships every day, all year. And honestly, I'm not seeing much spirit or energy in that direction. And if you're in the resiliency business like I am, like I'd argue we all are, I think we have to collectively call this out. You all know TRG Arts has a loyalty evolution story, a stair step that runs from one end of the loyalty continuum to the other. We use, as a, use it as a metaphor because it's consistently true. On the main, people in your community start as visitors, audiences, ticket buyers. And if we have our organizational stuff together and prioritize the relationships with these patrons with the long term in mind, we can grow sustaining income streams. This is just as true in my business as it is in yours. And this work has to be bigger than a good marketing campaign. It requires prioritization and investment, focus. In, in a word, it requires this. It might come as a surprise to you. Um, as a consultant, one of the most important parts of my work requires and is about listening. I'm constantly listening to what the field is surprised by, worried about, celebrating, and I'm always listening for strong leadership examples. I brought several of these uh, types of leadership examples with me today, and each of them believes in this, the power of the box office to grow and evolve these patron relationships. These are leaders like Camilla Holland, who's the managing director at the Royal Manitoba Theater Company in Winnipeg in Western Canada. And like this guy, Dan Bates, whom some of you know as the chief exec at Sheffield Theatres in England, and Vincent Van Vliet, who leads Phoenix Theatre in Arizona, in America. These leaders prioritize, invest in, and expect a patron-centric, customer-centric focus, and as a result, get results like this at RMTC over a five-year period, more than 100% growth in attendance, more than a million dollars in turnover or budget, 135% growth in philanthropy, a stable base of subscribers, 15,000 of them. Sheffield theaters, over a two year period, a million pounds and more in revenue growth while lowering the prices of 10,000 tickets, 70% increase in donors, memberships doubled, 45% increase in ticketing income while launching a subscription scheme. Or program. And finally, the Phoenix Theater, over a long period of time, $5 million growth in its budget, huge increases in, in ticketing income, in philanthropy, and yes, growing subscription. And it's in the context of all of this, these results, these leaders, these conversations, 
that I've begun thinking about and asking of our clients and the field three questions. First, this one, are you listening to the data? I mean, really listening. TRG has been rooted in data for a long time. We describe ourselves as a data-driven consulting company, and yet in 2019, there is so much more data to hear and to get distracted by. I mean, think about the sheer volume of data points that come across your email inbox every day, and I fear that the volume of that data allows us to be lulled into thinking that our team members are actually acting, that our team members are actually hearing that data. So first, are you listening to the data and what data are you choosing, curating to listen to? Second, are you listening to your customer? And again, I mean, really listening. At the beginning of this year, uh, we fielded a sector-wide survey about surveys. 2,000 international arts leaders got an impressive 15% response rate. I don't think you'll be surprised to learn that as a field, we are asking. More than 90% of the organizations who responded said they're regularly asking questions of their stakeholders, their customers. But of those, less than 15% actually reported doing something different as a result. Listening for action, like in any relationship, is a different kind of listening. And, and the team members in your box offices and guest service operations don't need surveys to hear. They hear all day, all the time. So do our websites and chat features, if we've got them structured in the right way. Which then leads to my third question, which is how could your organization become more able to act? Is customer data shared in your organization? Is, is your box office at the table when organizational decisions are made, consistently feeding in the voice of the customer? Is your box office team provided incentives for action to deepen relationships, help motivate the simple act of encouraging a customer to upgrade to a membership or add on tickets to a special event. Vincent described the way that his team operates this way. He said to me, we created our patron concierge service within our box office, a way for our patrons to not have to talk to two separate offices to transact their business, whether it's buying a ticket or making a contribution. What we found is that our growth has been tied to the moves we've made here to create an integrated environment. The voice on the team in the box office is equal to the voices in the marketing and fundraising offices. These teams come together to execute on strategy for the institution that prioritizes the patron. It's been critical to our success. The result has been that our box office is the place where the patron loyalty journey starts. So are, are you prioritizing your box office operation this way? You're curious about it. You're here. Is your team doing this type of work? Are they trained to? And, and maybe the hardest question I have of you today, do you have the right people to trust that they'll do this work enthusiastically and with your organization's needs in mind? Uh, you may be familiar with the woman in this photo. Uh, some of you may not be, um, but it relates to the concept of the Stockholm Syndrome. This is uh, Patty Hearst in the early 70s. She was an American heiress kidnapped. Um, the, the Stockholm Syndrome idea actually was first used in the media the year prior when four hostages were taken during a bank rob robbery in Stockholm and they, these hostages defended their captors after their release and they wouldn't testify against them. Patty uh, was kidnapped and ended up um, behaving similarly, uh, identifying with her captors as a survival mechanism. I'm taking, taking this out to the sharp end of the stick here, but I think you're, you're, you're seeing where I'm going here. The prisoner ends up aligning with the, the captor. And so 
the box office ends up working for whom? Every, every time I ask the question of an administrative team, whom does your box office report to? Think about this question in your organization for a moment. Whom does your box office report to in your organization? Uh, I know the bubble, thought bubbles in your head. Some of you are saying, I know where she's going. Some are saying finance, some are saying marketing. Uh, um, I would advocate that, that this is who your box office or guest service operation reports to, not you, not your organization, unless you're integrating them, providing tools, putting them at the strategic table, holding them responsible for organizational goals, not just making Mrs. Jones happy during a specific transaction. If I'm not being managed and supported by you, I'll get my attaboys and attagirls, my kudos, discipline, training from the customer. We secret shop our clients, we see it all the time. So in this kind of culture, how well are your organization's goals being meant, met? Rather, when, when there's actually a bigger incentive for a staff to a staff member to encourage Mrs. Jones just to wait for the discount that always ends up showing up, Mrs. Jones, or to invite her to move to this perfectly fine and it's a little less expensive seat, or to not invite her to add on additional tickets and become a member because it's just plain easier to do the transaction and get on with it. In this environment, indeed, websites, <laughs> websites provide better support of organizational resiliency goals. So I have a couple more questions for you now. I'm gonna read a statement for you, and I, I'm gonna ask you a question after. Consider this statement. My box office staff has provided incentives to invite patrons to do more, see more, experience more. They treat each, other, they treat each interaction as an opportunity, and if the opportunity doesn't present itself in the moment, they create a relationship. They'll get permission to be proactively in touch with patrons, to alert them to special events and experiences, and they have terrific follow-up. This happens via phone and through online contact, and we can see the result. So how do you respond to this statement? Yeah, that's us. We're pretty good at this. We try to do that. We do try, but it's hard. Oh my God, are you kidding? We would never do that. I wish like hell we did that. Or I'm, I'm really glad legitimately that we don't do that. It is not our job. So you are responding now. And I'm watching. And I like your honesty. And it is hard. That's what most of you are saying. We, we try to do that, but it's hard. It is hard. Think about <laughs> marriage is hard. Friendships are hard. Relationships are hard. Being, you know, the kindergarten rules, doing right by organizations and people is hard work. And that's what you're saying. We really try, but it's hard. And some of you are saying, I wish like, I wish we did that. Uh, uh, and, and we're not yet. Okay. So um, I've got one more question related to this. So think about your previous answer. And now tell me, if you're interested in making this paragraph that I described to you real, if it's appealing to you, but something's holding you back, what in your organization would have the biggest impact on changing that? Is it A, people? We, we just, Jill, we don't have the right ones. Or training. Listen, our, our staff was hired to, to fulfill tickets and, and admissions, not sell or manage relationships. We need training and GDPR, my God, what about permissions, training? Three, C, leadership. We need leadership that supports spirit, someone who makes this a priority, 
who develops the incentives, develops the program, and leads it. Number four, D, more staff. We can't not keep up with the sheer volume of calls we have right now. Or we're the, we're your, the narrative of box office is tech support. We, can, we need to fix our website. All these tools should be helping us, but they don't. And right now, that's the role that we're playing. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds here as we're seeing you vote. Training is, is becoming, and that foots with what we heard last, Sam, actually. We're trying it, but it's hard. And training is something that you're saying, as well as someone, a person, who makes it a priority, which then ties to this first point, right, of people. So all of you didn't get a chance to vote, but directionally we have the answer here. And I'm not surprised about that. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to this. Okay, so with all of this in mind, I, I wanna share with you and tuck into your brains uh, a preview of some of the most recent data analysis coming from TRG. I, I hope it will provide you a sense of urgency and um, uh, a sort of sense of commitment for getting this patron relationship thing right. So context first, for the past 15 years, many of you know this triangle, our firm has been applying and honing a loyalty model arts and, in arts and culture. It's a statistical way to describe patronage, associated revenues from them. The model considers all patrons all in, ticket buyers, donors, event attendees, everyone at once. We use this orientation um, in all the companies we operate across all the business models we encounter and generally the same story is rendered. Advocates are consummate loyalists, whatever that is defined, however that's defined in your organization. They are the most recent R in their behavior. Usually we're studying between five and 10 years. So think about your patron base. They're the most recent, the most frequent F, during the year, big flywheel, or over the study period. They invest the most monetarily. This is true even though we hate it sometimes. And their annual behavior on a household basis is at least stable or growing over the study period annually. RFMG, it's the math behind the model. Advocates score the highest here. Buyers are where we see the magic of and. These are the patrons who do this and that and this, but they aren't north, they aren't advocates. And together, these two groups make up less than 10% of household, households in the databases we study. In arts and culture, we don't benefit from Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, it's more like 90-10, especially in organizations that believe that loyalty is dead. In the UK, we're consistently seeing fewer than 5% of households being advocates and buyers, which leaves triers. These are folks whom we're trying to move from first time to second, or from last time, think lapsed behavior, to current, to now. This group is the hardest, or rather the largest, and here's the hard part. They're the most expensive. In, in the arts and cultural databases in this virtual room, I guarantee you that more than 90% of the households in your databases have the lowest ROI. They cost the most to acquire, the most to retain, and they invest the least, the least often. Also, earlier I mentioned the impending recession that's being predicted by most experts today. TRG's De De Good, he recently wrote about the implication for arts and culture, and he reminded us that there are six things that any arts and cultural organization can do in the face of a looming recession. The first three things describe organizational best practices like you see here, understanding your local realities, building unrestricted keyword cash reserves, and, and getting lots of the basics right. But the last three remind us that our current patrons represent the best source for weathering headwinds and inviting them to be part of a loyal, loyalty journey and retaining them along the way helps build the resiliency that will be required of us. 
on top of these economic realities, there's massive generational shift coming our way. We now have the ability to study the consumption behavior of arts consumers across five generational cohorts. And for 15 years, we've been tracking the behavior of arts patrons in this context. And as this charts describe, boomers and silent generation um, cohorts are declining in their arts participation. And by 2030, just a decade from now, we're predicting that the baby boomer generation will be entering the life stage where arts consumerism, well, we're not predicting, they will be. Uh, and that's the place by 2030 where arts consumerism begins to stall and contract. And by 2030, they're gonna represent less than 40% of arts consuming households. So, we all know, and the boomers in the room know this to be true, uh, health and life expectancy is gonna slow this stall. But by how much, no one can predict. And there still is no question. We have to start developing and sustaining relationships with younger generations of arts patrons. Which always brings us here to a discussion about millennials. And our, our field's near obsession with creating millennial audiences is completely understandable. This generation has the sheer volume of numbers to offset losses anticipated by boomers, and yet our research continues to show that millennials are not a silver bullet. Why? They're at a different life stage. The older among them are not even mid-career, and a majority are still establishing their professional footing. Complicating matters is the fact that they're choosing to have children later and slightly larger families that they like slightly more than prior generations before them, which means that the expense and time of children are gonna be a reality later into their lives. So when prior generations, Gen Xers and Boomers, were empty nesting and moving on to their own personal priorities and time, Millennials may still be caring for and prioritizing their families. Which then brings us to this group, the oft ignored Gen X cohort. I'm 52. I'm among the oldest of this generational group. I'm really so often amused by how often this group isn't talked about or considered um, like the silent generation before us. We follow the enormous and loud boomer group. Maybe we felt like a little quiet was in order. Uh, but depending on what data source you use, uh, this generational group is 10 to 15 percent smaller than the boomer group. This data is available and um, true in both North America and the UK, 10 to 15 percent smaller. So we're going to have to pray that boomers live longer or start cultivating millennials sooner unless we're prepared to shrink by 10 to 15 percent our organization's scope, sizes, and budgets. Here's the good news. Gen X is prime right now, and their behavior is positive. They are starting to grow their participation in things like subscription and philanthropy. And they're at the right optimal age for cultivating art att arts attendance, which according to our research and data is 44. Gen X is squarely here. Their children are older. They're becoming empty nesters. Their careers are established. Disposable time and income are growing now. As I said, subscription and philanthropy is growing at, un at rates unlike any other cohort, actually. So the time is now to deepen loyalty with boomers and grow loyalty with this Gen X cohort and invest for the long term with millennials. So what does this add up to? To me, it's this. Data doesn't do, people do. Clearly, data helps provide context. It sets up the narrative, provides the breadcrumb trail, but we have to act. And the people in your box office can and should be doing things that help you listen and uh, listen to that consumer and act. And if you are paying attention to tech writing today, you know how important the human touch is in the face of the, the power that tech has taken in our lives. Do you have the box office or guest services operation that can do this? If not, what could you do? What are you prepared to do? So here's the final question. 
we're, we're obsessed here at TRG with leadership action that gets results. We can't let you leave without talking about one thing that you could do soon. So choose as many as you like, but here's a smattering, a smattering of things that you could do. Which of them resonate with you? Can you prioritize the box office with your time? Especially I'm thinking about you as an executive leader. Can you give your box office leadership a, a seat at your senior leadership table? Can you hire the right manager, the right leader, or fire the one that's not? Can you reorient box office team, your team, around newly designed goals or invest in regular training? You could pay incentives when goals are met or exceeded. And you could insist on accountability toward key loyalty metrics. Remember that question I asked, are you listening to the data and what data are you listening to? Pick three things that relate to sustainable, resilient revenue. So I'm seeing you respond and you're saying, I can reorient my team around newly designed goals and I could invest in regular training. I could insist on accountability. You don't like the idea of paying very much, which I find interesting. Uh, and we should talk about. You said I can hire the right manager, but really what you're, what you're saying you can do, and it's a terrific place to start, this deck is gonna be available. There, there is a way to start a conversation in and around this subject. So with that in mind, um, you know we'll share the recording so you can watch again and, and share the link. And if you're interested in more on this theme and topic around resiliency, you, you should read Arts Leadership Review. It's our fall issue. It's available on the um, digital platform issue. We'll include a link in the email we send you so that you can see that, that digitally. And you know, most importantly, I want to, want to thank you for being here, for sharing my interest and enthusiasm about the role that box offices and guest service operations can and should be playing. But I also want to make sure and that we have time now to answer some of the questions that we've collected throughout the webinar. So Sam, you're gonna help me field as many as, the, as, as we uh, can in our remaining time together. And let's just see what we've got. Okay, our first question is, our box office is part of a consortium. It would be great if you could distinguish in-house and outsourced box offices. If that's a statement, I would agree. Uh, I'm, I'm not hearing a question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, just, I'm just gonna raise that reality up and say, I know, and challenge you anyway, to play the political game that enables you to have the conversation with the leader um, who runs that consortium box office, if it's at a venue, or if it's a consortium that's loose um, and not associated with a venue. Um, it wouldn't be, it would be associated with a venue. And, and share this content because it's in everyone's best interest. It does make it harder, it does, but it does not make it impossible. And then I would ask the question, what of your patron management should belong and reside with you? Because if your patron relationships need to be sticky to you, is there a segregation of of duties, so to speak, that could happen so that volume happens in one area and more loyalty-oriented conversations could happen in another. And if you want to talk more about this, please email me at Let's Talk. What's next? Jill, we have a poor CRM. What steps or strategies do you recommend to revitalize this important tool? Um, uh, poor CRMs um, are not the reason to not do this work. How about that for a double negative? Um, this work can be done on three by five cards. It's harder, but it can be done. And, and so 
the way to revise a CRM is to either dig into training, because I can't tell you how many times in talking with CRM providers, they will say, people don't take advantage of our training. Invest in that training. And if you don't like, if your requirements, which include some of these things we're talking about, are not met by your CRM vendor, then change. But don't let that CRM system be an excuse. Start something um, that enables this kind of revenue generating, loyalty generating behavior to happen. Okay. What types of incentives are given to box office staff for achievements? And how do you then not pay incentives to other marketing staff members? Yeah, right. This is a great question. Um, the, the incentives that work the best in every country we operate is cash. But it doesn't have to be big cash. Um, this is cash that motivates um, achieving most often monthly organizational revenue goals. Jill is not pitted against Sam. Um, incentives are paid based on, the only difference is, is Sam only fulfilling or mostly fulfilling? And is Jill mostly on the phone? If Jill's mostly on the phone, I'm paid more, but think 25 pounds or, or $20. Think 250 um, uh, uh, dollars. And, and to answer the question about um, why we're not paying elsewhere, um, what is true is that there are different pay scales and different, incent different compensation programs for different types of employees. And I will often be quip, you know, quip that if your marketing staff wants to work in the box office, you can invite them to apply for that job. And that's a little too quippy but there's some reality to it. Don't let that fear prevent you from doing something that actually motivates a team. You can do pizza parties, you can do free, you know, enter to win a free airline ticket, all those things. It just doesn't work in the same way. Uh, and your time and leadership attention is more important than all of it. Jill, what are some of the changes we can make in our organization to have the box office at the table? Are you suggesting that box office leadership should be part of our senior leadership team? I guess I am. Yeah, I think I am. And uh, I've got a smile on my face because I, I think as I, as I imagine our virtual clients and the, and the people in this room, I know that that isn't common. And I know where those teams report. And I know that if you're not hearing from those leaders on a regular basis in your senior leadership teams, then it will be filtered. It requires a culture so that the person who comes can speak clearly and you can easily do something like I do at TRG where I have direct reports, but a broader senior leadership team of seven that report to my direct reports. So I supervise a group of people and they supervise people who are also on the senior leadership team so that I have a firsthand touch and feel in what's going on in the business. But yes, that's what I'm suggesting. We have time for one or two more. Where could I find more training or resources regarding box office operations? Yeah, I'm glad somebody asked this because it came up as a need. Um, uh, I haven't encountered, and if somebody knows, I would love to hear from you at Let's, let, let's Talk. I have not encountered a, a firm, there's an entrepreneurial opportunity out here for someone, a firm that um, does box office guest service in arts and culture training specifically. Um, but I have heard our clients um, uh, engage trainers from companies, for-profit companies that have perishable inventory, kind of like airlines. Um, a client of ours who took this super seriously in the UK um, hired a person who had worked for Virgin Airlines and that brought that person in to do weekly trainings of the box office and senior leadership team. I've also heard hotel companies um, um, being tapped to do similarly uh, uh, effective jobs. But, but you know, you put the right leader in place 
and give them some uh, tools that are online or, or other workshops, allow them to design. Develop your own, but, but it, it has to happen. It has to happen. Okay, so we are down to the wire here. I'll take one more question, Sam, and then, um, and then I will wrap up. Where would you recommend starting when you have a box office of only one to two people? I'd recommend starting with that with you and that other person. And, and I mean that. We, we have clients who are very small, like, like you're describing. And so what that means is, first, you create alignment with your board and executive leader that the box office or guest service operation can and should be helping the organization achieve revenue results. And then you test one thing. You test, we're going to, for the next 90 days, 90 day tests are brilliant. Everyone can get their head wrapped around 90 days. For 90 days, we're gonna test inviting people to become members. And we're gonna measure those results. And when you come back and measure the results and say we made $10,368, that begins to make a case for additional resources. Moving the paradigm in, in this part of our operation from expense only to revenue and loyalty changes everything. Okay, so I uh, really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I do invite you to connect, connect with us, sign up for our regular recurring email newsletter, follow us on social media. And always, if there's additional questions we can answer, please reach out um, at, tier, at let's talk at trgarts. Com. Thank you again for joining me for this webinar series. Enjoy the rest of your day and as we head into the weekend, your weekends. Thanks, you all. Bye-bye for now.